This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I read a book. I watched a movie and skimmed through another one. Mm. This week we're doing Animal Farm by George Orwell. Now, don't be confused. There's not a new Animal Farm coming out. This was an audience suggestion that we got to us, and we went, hmm, we've been looking for ways to open up the concept of the show a little bit and do other adaptations, classics, or, you know, th that's kind of what we've been focusing on um, more recently. We've been doing the more pop culture, what's week to week, but we want to make a move to say we want to do more classics and we want to do more things that people love and want to know more about why and understand why they love them more. That's so somebody <laughs> reached out to us on Instagram and said, hey, I really like Animal Farm. I don't really think this will work as an episode. And we said, ha ha ha, yeah. <laughs> we're going to do it anyways. Okay. And it works. So if you have any ideas for either classic books that you know are adapted into something or classic movies that might have been based on something, shout out to us at IlliteratePod on Instagram and maybe we will do it on an episode on a week you never that know. is slow, such as this one. <laughs> yeah, and especially the, the beginning of the year, all of the Oscar people are, you know, all those movies are out. And so we got kind of the bottom barrels out <laughs> right now. So this, well, we, we said, why not? Let's do a classic, and what better than Animal Farm? Off the top, I have read 1984. It was my favorite book in high school. I believe I read it briefly my freshman year of college, but I haven't touched it since then. But I've never actually read Animal Farm. I've had it kind of explained to me. I think I've watched some YouTube things back in the day. But to I, pass so, some quiz or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, so this was a, 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 a lovely one to, to embark down. I got to watch the animation from 1954. It was beautiful. It was great. I mean, it's, it's everything of an animation of that time. And mm -hmm. so it's antiquated in that way. But I love that. And then to compare, I went to the 1999 TV movie which I want to say off the top, it's a TV movie, but let, let's just listen to this cast. Kelsey Grammer, Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Uh, I can't say his last name, but you'll recognize him if you saw him. Pete Post with Haith. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's the main character. He plays the farmer, uh, yeah. and they expand the farmer and his family a ton. That becomes a lot of the backbone through that one. And Patrick Stewart plays Napoleon. The uh, you can't, you, yeah, you can't get better than that. So I went into not, you know, expecting not much from it. Uh, and it was actually pretty incredible by what I saw. <laughs> I mean, so this is a couple years after Babe and Charlotte's Web. So this type of thing is really hot right, right then in cinema, mm -hmm. in the late 90s, uh, CG and uh, animatronics are in that beautiful union through the mid nine, mid late nineties, and yeah. so that is how they achieve most of this stuff. They take aesthetic properties right out of the animation. It was really great. Uh, it was not what I was expecting at all. It was especially when Taylor sent it to me. I was like, oh god, a TV <laughs> movie. He, he was even like, you could watch it on double speed. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, well, and I opened it up, and instantly it has a very, a very, uh, it has a great tone. And I was really, I was really shocked by uh, mm. how uh, how good that that version of it is. Now. Yeah. I didn't watch the whole thing. I, I watched the first act and then skimmed through the back half. But what I saw was really worth your time. It's interesting how these movies where the because it's a novella, it's only 112 pages, super succinct. It's exactly what it needs to be. And a lot of times those shorter stories work really well as an hour long mm -hmm. movie. But yeah, this this came out. The, the novella came out first in England in August of 1945. Now, just for comparison, when did 1984 come out? 1984 oh. came out in 49, so ah, four okay. years after there we go. this. Animal Farm is a direct allegory of the events leading up to the Russian Revolution of 1917 and then on to the Stalinist era of the Soviet Union going into World War II. Mm. And the reason this book was controversial in the time was because the Soviet Union was allied with England, and he was throwing a lot of shade on them mm. and what had happened in the previous decades. Yeah. And, he, and Orwell's living where? In England. In England. Yeah. Okay. And so a lot of people didn't like it. We'll get into how a little bit about his life and how his attitude shaped these books that we know and there's an adjective now based on his name if things are right. Orwellian. Oh. It's a dystopian, you know. Orwellian. Yeah. <laughs> that hasn't been done since Dickensian. <laughs> so it's pretty crazy how he had these two books that then change how we think about yeah. totalitarian governments. They, they become synonymous with power. Uh, and, I mean, it's, just, it's the go-to um, when you want to talk about power, power dynamics and oppression. Yeah. Like we said, the book is a direct allegory to these things. We're not going to go hugely into 
the Russian Revolution of 1917. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a historian, but it is. Well, it's it's about this farm. For those that don't know, just the brief two second thing where the animals decide there needs to be an uprising and take over the farmer. They kick him out, and the pigs are the ruling class of this. And it's supposed to be a perfect socialist society. One of them takes over, starts changing the rules, making stuff up, subjugating, building characters. windmills. What's that? <laughs> Building windmills. I just yeah, remember yeah. Snowball uh, yeah. Uh, drawing the plans for the windmill. And like, yeah. This is, this is going to save us all. I don't know. Yeah. So then, no, yeah. So all of that stuff then is reference to the Russian Revolution of 1917, Lenin, Stalin, that period of Russian history. Mm-hmm. All these things are directly mm-hmm. referenced. So animalism is what the main pig is saying should be, and that is directly referenced to communism. Uh, He has these seven laws of what animalism is. And then over the course of the story, they change over time, which is what Stalin did, where he was like, well, actually, this is how history was. And you guys don't remember that. They have a flag which has a horn and a hoof, which is directly referenced to the hammer and sickle (laughs) of the Soviet Union. And not going into the story too much, but just so you can see how much Napoleon, the main pig, is Joseph Stalin. Snowball, the other pig, is Trotsky, Mm -hmm. who got excommunicated from the Soviet, well, he got killed in real life, but in, in uh, the story, he gets removed. No, they kill him in the animation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know yeah. what they did do him in the 99 version. <laughs> um, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's heavily, uh, They don't. you don't see it on the screen, but like the dogs yeah. come back and tell Napoleon, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, in the, in the book, he gets removed, but then gets uh, used as an excuse for all of the bad things yeah. that are happening, used as a, as a scapegoat, scape pig if you will. The farmer, Mr. Jones, is Tsar Nicholas II, who came before. The raven, some people say, represent the Russian Orthodox Church, because he brings the raven back later on and says, oh, there's this sugar candy mountain thing that everybody is aspiring to. Uh, The sheep are very much representative of the crowds that Stalin would use to drown out Trotsky Mm. during his speeches. Mm. The old boar is Lenin, who drew up the plans of the revolution. And they put his skull, the pig skull, in the story out for for all the other animals to see. Oh. And uh, Lenin's body is actually out for people to see. It's embalmed in Red Square, and you can go visit it if you want. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, <laughs> still exists. Metal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just to see, all these different things are directly based on what happened in real life, and George Orwell wanted to pe- people to see that. The reason he decided to do this was he had, and we'll get into his life about how he was a writer writing stuff, but he had written a book based on his experiences. And then he saw in these experiences, this guy, this other guy, Arthur Kestler, who was a friend of his, wrote this other book called Darkness at Noon, which is about the same war that they were involved in. Mm. But it was fiction. It was a fictional account of this thing. Okay. George Orwell's book sold 638 copies. And this other guy's book, Darkness at Noon, sold half a million copies in France alone. Oh, God. So he was like, oh, uh, we got to do fiction then. This is the <laughs> only way to get this message across. Nobody wants to hear what actually happened. <laughs> so then that's why he decided, oh, I'm going to do it as an allegory yeah. instead of just explaining it exactly as it happened. But there are other inspirations, predecessors to this, which uh, have just been found out way more recently than I thought. Oh, an o- really? An older one that was known previously, though, was uh, Gulliver's Travels, if mm. you've heard of that mm-hmm. before. came out in 1726. At the very, very end of his travels, he comes across this society, which is a representation of Britain at the time, where there are humans who are subservient to horses Um, where the horses are super smart and the humans are being trod upon and whatnot. And he's speaking to the horses and he ends up relating more to the horses and denigrating the humans in this (laughs) land. And it's like, dude, you're a human. Um, But they they give them different names, but the humans are called yahoos. And that is the first origin of that term. So if you hear somebody Uh. being called a yahoo... (laughs) It's from Gulliver's They're a stupid person that's being (laughs) controlled by horses. Yeah. (laughs) You're being controlled by horses. (laughs) Yeah. But the more the more recent stories that are similar to this, there is a guy called Vladislav Raymond, who is a Polish author, and he wrote a story called Bunt. I think that's how you pronounce it. Mm. Polish. I, probably not. But forgive us. It's called The Revolt. <laughs> that's the translation. It came out in 1922. This was only discovered in 2004 because it was banned in Poland from 1945 to 1989, and it is a story from the perspective of these animals who revolt from the farmer on the farm and cast him out and whatnot. Oh, really? 
Yeah. Wow. But, I mean, you, even as it was starting, you know, just because I've never actually read it myself, mm-hmm. as it was starting, I'm going, man, how perfect of a, you know, <laughs> of a, uh, a device here, yeah. the farm. Um, the creatures that and we humanize and the, and and the, the personalities. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I was, uh, just coming into the animation, I was sitting down. And saying, Man, what a what a fantastic device! He's the first one to think of this. Wow. So uh, not not quite exactly. Yeah. There's one even before this one that, that got tamped down. Mm. Nikolai Kostomarov, written in 1880. It was called The Farm Animals Revolt, mm. um, and it was published though in 1917 in a Russian magazine, which is interesting because it came out even before the revolution. So he's not even talking about the things that right. are that Orwell is talking about <laughs> or in the revolt in right. this Polish one. But it's the same conceit of yeah. this farm and the animals are taking back the power. Because the themes are just timeless. I mean, yeah. the, the the ideals of oppression here, I mean, the, like like I said earlier, it happens time and time again through history. So it's it's fantastic when you find a work that can send you through all of those echoes. Yes, mm-hmm. it's commenting on something directly. Yes, specific history. But also that is a representation of how, how history echoes itself. Um, yeah. It's fantastic when you actually can get something that actually shows that in an authentic way. Yeah. And, 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 and you only realize that until you realize that because you've felt it without knowing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm getting ethereal as I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I want you here. So back to basics. Why then does this matter? Why does Orwell have a bone to pick with all of this? <laughs> What's his skin in the game? He was not born George Orwell. Oh, really? As we find out oh! most of these authors are. And we'll find out why he changed his name. He was born Eric Blair, uh, high society British. Although I think in so, it's some weird quote. He describes himself as like upper, middle, lower class. or something. Like, <laughs> It's all a jumble. But he, Same baby. He was born. <laughs> <Middle lower. laughs> he was born overseas. He was uh, British educated, though, eaten social, high social class, that kind of thing. Mm. Hated it. Mm. Um, didn't like mm-hmm. how those structures were instituted upon him. And so he decided, based on his family's influence in India and in that part of the world, that he was going to leave school and go live over there. So he joined the British police, and I don't know exactly all the politics of that, okay. but he ended up in Burma, which is now Myanmar. But he had a book about it later, and in that time also he's like, he can see and he regrets kind of what he ended up doing there, because it's so imperialist why are there British policemen in this place? Like, they shouldn't even hmm. be there. So, in the late 20s, he moves back over to Europe hmm. after doing that. And he was very, very inspired by Jack London, who had written a book in 1903 called The People of the Abyss, where Jack London lived in the slums of the East End of London and mm-hmm. wrote memoirs and travel style stuff of what it was actually like to be in this terrible lower class and how they were being treated and oppressed and all of oh, that. Okay. So George Orwell had read this yeah. many years before in his, in his adolescence and was like, oh, that's what I should be doing. So he moved and lived in London and Paris and lived among the tramps and the slums and all of that and was sending his articles to magazines and was saying, oh, I got to write a book about this. So he wrote a book called Down and Out in Paris and London oh. about those experiences. But he didn't want to harm his family's name or make them feel like they were going to be made to look like fools. Mm-hmm. So he went by George Orwell for uh, this book, and then I that see. just became his writer's name for the rest of this, because he's like, I'm going to write about the poverty-stricken and the I oppressed. See. Yeah, um, never heard of the, the Paris book, Down and Out in Paris? Down and Out in Paris and London, yeah. And that's not. I love that title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that title's awesome. Uh, it makes me want to read it. <laughs> yeah. He wrote another book in a similar vein called Road to Wigan Pier, uh, which is based on the social conditions, the miners' struggle in northern England. Similar concept, arguing heavily, though, in the second part, it's more essays about socialism, Mm. democratic socialism. This book led him to being placed under surveillance by the special branch uh, from 1936 for 12 years until one year before the publication of 1984. The special branch is like the domestic counterterrorism unit in Mm -hmm. the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So after he wrote this stuff, they're like, we got to watch this guy. (laughs) Got an eye on him. Yeah. You can't just go around saying this boy. (laughs) He marries this gal, Eileen, and they're like, we got to do something about this. We could, we could just sit here in England. Lo and behold, right around this time, the Spanish Civil War is going on, 1936. Ah. So he joins as an international unit to help in Spain fight the Spanish Civil War against Francisco Franco, who was then su- supported by Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. 
in this time, he becomes jaded by how his, and this is the start of his understanding of, well, I got to write something like Animal Farm. This was his actual book that he wrote that then only sold 638 yeah. copies was this experience. But he realized the people that he were fighting for, that whole system was being corrupted. But in this time, he was shot by a sniper because he was like 6'3". He was much taller than the other forces. <laughs> he was shot through the throat. Uh, the bullet happened so fast that it just cauterized the wound immediately, but he couldn't talk for like two weeks. Oh my He gosh. eventually got his voice back, but it was always very soft and he had trouble speaking and his lungs were severely hurt as well. I did um, not know that. That's amazing. They said his voice would never return oh, and wow. then it returned. So because of that, he can't fight anymore. So he goes back to England. Like I said, he's jaded by this revolution. World War II, <laughs> la-di-da. <laughs> he's unfit for service though. Here we go. You yeah. Know? Because of, because of the sniper bullet. So uh, he's unfit for service. He and his wife still want to do something. His wife's brother was killed in the Dunkirk evacuation, if you're really? familiar with that movie that uh, Christopher Nolan did recently. Yes, yes. So his wife's, his wife's brother was involved in that. He was stuck in France. He didn't make it wow. back. George Orwell worked at the BBC radio for two years, and now he's still writing articles and magazines and doing broadcasts to India. He's very involved in that kind of work. This is really, this is a journey. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I feel like I'm Indiana Jones going globetrotting all over this place. Yeah. <laughs> all this time, he's trying to write Animal Fighting Farm. a good fight. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you like socialism. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, against the communists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is writing Animal Farm during this time, getting rejected a bunch. At this time, also, his house gets bombed in England. He had to search through the rubble for his various books and manuscripts and whatnot. Mm. There's only one manuscript of his original that's available oh, really? uh, to this day. So in terms of this animal farm, you can see why he would be denied. He, one of the ones that rejected it was a publisher called Faber and Faber, which, if we remember from an earlier episode, was the one that did uh, T.S. Eliot's Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. <laughs> they were in the time doing that. T.S. Eliot, at the time, was the director of Faber and Faber. Oh, wow. Uh, and he rejected George Orwell's <laughs> Animal Farm because it was too scandalous. I just immediately got a sexualized, a sexualized version of anim Animal Farm <laughs> in my mind, and I went, oh, God, no. <laughs> Good thing he, was, yeah, he might want to make some changes. <laughs> anyway. So like I said, the one publisher that did accept it and then rejected it, there's this thing which is now disbanded in the UK called the Ministry of Information that was going on during World War II. And they gave this publishing company pressure mm. and was like, hey, you can't publish this. Later found out the civil servant in the Ministry of Information who gave the order was a Soviet spy. Uh. And so that's why he was giving them pressure not to push it. His name was Harry Peter Smolka. A Smolen. regular old O'Brien. Yeah. <laughs> His real name was Hans Peter Smolka. O'Brien is a character that turns on the main characters in 1984. If you don't know, I know that's not the book we're covering. But <laughs> I just thought I should put that in there. References. There's references all over the place. <laughs> Orwell had written later in his life a list of people that he was suspicious of, and this guy was on the list. <laughs> like, ah, well. <laughs> well, I was right about that one. I, I, I ought to keep lists of my of my suspected enemies. <laughs> yeah, your arch -nemesis. I ought to keep lists like that just so I can go, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, though, he eventually got it published. Frederick Warburg published it, but this guy got a bunch of pressure against the ingratitude towards Stalin because they were like, this is obviously, if you were around that time, you know exactly yeah. all the people that he's referencing. And of course, Snowball the Pig is Trotsky. <laughs> so Orwell wrote in the original thing a preface about censorship. There was room in the original publishing, like there was pages for it, but lost to history. It never got published. It has hardly ever been included in any copy of the book, but it was published much later as an essay in 1972. Oh. His preface for the book being like, hey, I know y'all going to censor stuff was not in <laughs> the book. <laughs> so maybe the publisher felt they so had too Animal much pressure. So Animal Farm had a, had a preface of censorship? About in censorship that they, in that English. Then they <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's an essay now. I'll post a link to it. You can you can read it if you want, but it, it exists. It was found and, and is available, How but bizarre. they still don't put it in the books. Yeah. So now that Animal Farm is published... He goes to Paris because the war is over. Like I said, he couldn't fight in it. He's back on the game of doing correspondence, writing articles, writing essays. He goes to Paris to write about the liberation of France 
during this time, his wife goes in for a hysterectomy and dies. Oh my gosh. Uh, this is 1945, months after Animal Farm gets published. He's in Paris and his wife is dead. Oh man. He continues writing, writing, writing articles. He decides he's going to write 1984. But again, his lungs are doing terrible. In one of these articles and essays that he's been writing, some people theorize, because it hasn't been documented elsewhere, that he's the first person to use the phrase, the Cold War. Really? There was an essay that came out in the Tribune in 1945, where he talks about it directly in relation to the Soviet Union. Wow. And so he's credited as coming up with that phrase. Yeah. 1984, though, gets published in 49, and then... Months later, in January of 1950, uh, an artery in his lung bursts mm. and he dies at the age of 46. Gosh. What's so interesting to me about this whole span of his life is that during his life, he is known as the journalist and essays and correspondence and all of that stuff. But more modernly, he's known for those two books. Yeah, the cautionary tales. Or, well, in, yeah. you know, uh, Animal Farm in 1984. So it's like if Anderson Cooper or Tom Brokaw or something, yeah. was known later for two random novels. For having that incredible they forethought into the, <laughs> yeah. into the future and back through time about what we shouldn't do. Yeah, in the form of fictional <laughs> about novels. About how we can fall. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems strange. Both that, together and inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a statue that was commissioned of him that is erected outside of the headquarters of the BBC. Oh, really? That got put up in 2017, and the plaque on the front is a phrase from the preface that was never published. <laughs> and the phrase is, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. There you go. I love that. Um, there you go. Yeah. One odd part of this that goes into the history of World War II and after into the Cold War between 1952 and 1957, this book was actually weaponized by America. So the CIA was in West Germany. There was an operation what? called <laughs> a dinosaur. And they launched, and this is, you can look this up. I'll post the link. They launched millions of 10-foot wide balloons carrying copies of Animal Farm and dropped them over Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia. What? They were trying to spread that as propaganda into the Soviet Union. I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm mouth agape right now. This yeah. is the, I'm both I love it and I'm really unsettled by that <laughs> all at once. I'm both like hell yeah, that's awesome, and I'm both like we should never do anything like this. <laughs> right? Like, wait, wait, what, did we, what did we do? Forcibly putting <laughs> yeah. Animal Farm into yeah. people's hands, just trying to like it, uh, affect the thought of foreign countries. It's just like <laughs> oh, some psyop stuff through an you parachuted in Orwell. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> they need to know. Conversely, the opposite happened in terms of censorship, which has been going on for a while with this book. It's on the most banned books or controversial books list. But in 2018, China banned mentions of Animal Farm 1984 from social media and the Internet. Like you could not. Oh, I wonder if he's on. hitting on something. There. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Well, I wonder if yeah. this 1984 and Animal Farm stuff is all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> Now we come to the film versions. Yeah, this 1954, only, right? Yeah, 1954. This has only been adapted twice in film, like you said, the 1954 and then the 1999. Yeah, um, it's pretty fast. Now you know it was as uh, just a few moments ago as we were going through the the, the ends of his life. I'm like realizing, okay, 1984 comes out in 49, or and then he dies really quickly after that, and then and then I remembered like, oh yeah, and then that thing comes out in 1954. But then th that is the exact moment where you said <laughs> that we weaponized. <laughs> It. Right. And then it kind of made sense. <laughs> well, you'll be interested to know that this was another weaponization. So this movie. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. 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 Was paid for by the CIA. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was another Cold War <laughs> offensive. Uh, this was, since we're in Oscar season as well, and this is topical, this is the first woman director of an animated feature since really? 1926. Wow. Since movies started. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. Bachelor is is her last name. Propped up by the CIA. And <laughs> A it, psyop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about that? Also, Animal Farm, <laughs> this movie that you watched, was Britain's first animated feature film. Really? Yeah. And the CIA paid for it. It was this guy, E. Howard Hunt. And we've talked about him 
vaguely before. He was the guy in The Irishman who gave Frank Sheeran oh the guns. Oh, my God. And he was convicted for the Watergate burglaries. Oh, my God. He was known as having really big ears. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, he's the guy who paid for this <laughs> to be made into this a movie. This is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Although he did have one criticism, which then the animators had to do, which was the ending is changed so that the animals uprise one last time and take over. This Napoleon. is what I was wondering. Yes. Yeah. Because they uh, they uprise one last time and it ends on that that they you know they got it back. They got him. It ends on bloody murder. Um, <laughs> right. And then the ninety nine version, it it seemed as if just time passed. The animals had um, been relegated to the woods. Now reclaim the farm, mm-hmm. and then it just seemed that that other people took it over eventually and that's just, it kind of fades out that right. way so very different endings so i was wondering how the actual thing yeah ends. the original book is a cautionary tale kind of horrifying when you're reading it because it goes into how the pigs are slowly turning into more like humans yeah. and they start wearing clothes and yeah. walking on two legs and drinking alcohol and smoking cigars sleeping in beds <gasps> yeah that's one of the rules <laughs> <laughs> they're sleeping in beds Without sheets. They're yeah, yeah, like and they, they, they addend them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then the pigs are convening with the other farmers on the English countryside. They're meeting together. They change the animal farm back to manor farm. They're in there playing cards, and all the animals are looking in, and they can't tell who is a pig and who is a human, and you can kind of see how the pigs are human now. Like it didn't get any better. So it ends like that horrifyingly. Man, that's wild. Yeah. Now I'm thinking about the film versions. And so neither in like that. And they try to give it at least an upswing. Um, well, as propaganda, it's like we got to stop yeah. the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And as soon as the animation ends, it ends, like we said, on, on them uprising and bloody murder. And I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there going, you know, in my ethereal echoes through time. I'm going, that's right. We'll come back. You know, like yeah. you, you can't keep them down, you know. <laughs> and then but that's exactly what it is devised to do. That's mm-hmm. exactly the emotion they wanted to instill in anybody who was watching it in, <laughs> in, in the these places in, in at that time um uh, it did it, it did it to me i mean mm-hmm. and because it's because these things are are it's not like things are all rosy out there right now so you know <laughs> it, it, we sit in our own context and so i'm i'm here charged in my context watching this that was a psyop from 1954 devised to actually get you a little bit angry because the future uh, was unfounded you know, we didn't Absolutely. know that the Soviet Union was going to collapse. <laughs> uh, and, and it's just echoing to me. It's like, wow, man, this is uh, they did it. <laughs> they got they got it. Because <laughs> I'm sitting there going, you can't keep us down. Can't yeah. keep can't keep a working man down. <laughs> and yeah, actually, that's exactly what they wanted you to feel. Right. <laughs> the 1999 version, though, the CIA I guess. paid for it. How about yeah. that? <laughs> the 1999 version, the CIA did not pay for it. <laughs> Uh, and it has a different ending as well, because it's just time passes, yeah. and then Napoleon gets ousted by time. If you push everybody out, if you are actually pushing out all your resources without knowing it, then what do you have left to stand on? I think that's what they're getting at. You either have revolt or you have it imploding, Yeah, in- and somebody else has to take over. Yeah, I think that exactly is. The, the other one ends in revolt. This one ends in a slow decline. It implodes on itself, and it just falls into the ground. But yeah, after this, like you said, you're more familiar, and maybe people are more familiar in general with 1984, right? where he gives a much more direct, this is the fallout of that, if you let it keep going. This is following all of these ideas to the nth degree and saying that it doesn't implode, that it just keeps going, to a point of which we don't even, if you want, you can say they're the same society, uh, but it would be a big brother being Napoleon. In 1984, you wouldn't even know if Napoleon was real. Yeah. That's how far it's gotten. These two stories definitely muddy the same waters. They brush up on each other, but I think they look in very different directions. And I would say that the 1984, if you if you want to get down to the difference in between these two, I think 1984 really lies in take the moment where there the animals are being gaslit about the rules being changed Mm -hmm. you can't sleep in a bed with no sheets yeah 1984 is a much more cerebral internal experience Mm -hmm. about how thought can change and move that is where that book lives so i i would say yes i understand why people can conflate these and and almost forget that they're different but i i 
they 1984 has a lot more to offer in terms of the interpersonal how do i feel Mm -hmm. about things being changed on a dime and and can i trust even my lover in the the most the most uh the most uh intimate people that i think i know can't do i do i really what what is reality that that book takes on those types of things whereas Uh, animal farm is just a direct allegory to the time and place yes and hit people too close to home when it came out. And I was taken in the animation, I was taken with how Napoleon is able to capture power. That was the thing that I was really struck by in terms of a, a, a kind of a cautionary tale. tale. Yeah. I was looking for what are the signs of somebody going uh, a little bit too far? Or go, uh, what are the motivations mm-hmm. really there? And how do you, how are you able to capture power and then eventually will your citizens Mm -hmm. into your will. And I will Um, post a link in the show notes because we're not going to get into all of it, but if this interests you, people have plotted every single plot point, everything that Napoleon the pig does is a reference to something that happened in the Soviet Union before 1917 and thereafter, before World War II. All of the instances where he's saying, oh, we're going to do this, or oh, no, that didn't happen, or oh, these animals are going to be executed, directly references Mm -hmm. a Mm real-life moment in history i think that is the power of, of this is, is is really right there showing how these things are possible how what the movements actually look like if they're playing out in front of you mm. i think that is the, va- the 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 immediate value in this look red flags right here right here look he's hiding from them you know he's this is going on they don't know uh, that they're still alive and, and nobody else even knows you know, yeah all those types of things um that was where the strength in this really was 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 revealing itself to me. Where mm-hmm. again, in 1984, is much more cerebral. Um, do I am I sure? Yeah, but yeah, this has this was definitely something that we appreciate being uh, told about it. Yeah, we we check it out. We were looking for ways to expand the the formula of the show, and this this just popped up, and with, even with a challenge, and we were like, Mah-ha-ha-ha. so reach out to us if there is a classic movie and and I don't mean classic in the strict sense but if there is a revered movie Mm -hmm. that is based on something and you want to know more about it let us know we'll do maybe we'll do a show on it if there is a book that has a bunch of stuff and you don't either way it goes from the literary side or the film side we're willing to take a look at it just get in touch with us at illiterate pod on Instagram and thank you so much for listening and we will see you all next week (laughs) 